you'll notice is not a weed smoker. The yeah. greatest, greatest people in the world, you'll see, you just don't see that they're smoking weed. You don't get to tremendous levels of greatness by, by smoking. It seems to be something that pulls a person much further away from his greatness. And uh, it's sad because there's so much potential that people have. But they, uh, they get, you know, some indica and they're in the couch. And the mom is uh, not doing anything. So it's sad. I'm not talking about real therapeutic medicinal usages. There, for Rahman al cancer patients and things, Hashem Yirachem, that there's Hashem made usages for ganja, for real medicinal, like real intense medicinal usages and anti inflammatory usages. This is not medical advice. But for recreational usage, you see, it just takes a person on a, a downward trajectory in their life. And it's sad. It's sad. We want people to go on an upward trajectory. We want people to be mega successful in this world. And all the mega, mega successful people that you look at that really were difference makers in the world, they just weren't getting high and sitting on the couch. But even there, you see that he really... He was high all the time. I love you, but... The weed didn't make him great. Smoke two joints in the morning, smoke two joints at night. That's a black So it's, it's interesting. So, so there it became a bit of a, of a, a bit of a worship. So we have to tell the world that you can't, you can't, you can't worship any grass or substance. It's only worship of God. And if somebody needs a certain like high in order to have that worship, it's a problem because it's like dependent on something. We're speaking about this also when we talk about happy hour, the people that they, they can only come home to spend time with the kids because they had happy hour. They came, you know, they, they drank a little bit, so it like made life easier. Or what about a guy that he says, you know, you know why he smoked and got high? Because it helps him deal with stress. So I'm a little bit stressed out, so let me just go light up a big one and just uh, get high. So, yeah. Well, what about someone who does mushrooms with DMT once and then becomes religious? <laughs> like half an issue. <laughs> so. You jumped a few meters. <laughs> so. Hashem does many things that we don't always understand. Can people have eye-opening experiences? They can. But there's a number of reasons why there's a lot of uh, concern. Number one, we are such an addictive nation. We're such an addictive, I mean nation, I mean humanity. Humanity is sick. We're so addictive. So there's a general approach that a person takes something, they get high, and then the law of diminishing returns, they need even more, and more, and more, and more. And that's not good because they're always just trying to get to that level of that high that they were always seeking. That's a big problem. Number two, you don't know what's going to happen with a person. A person sometimes has a bad trip. That's not good. Meaning people can, it can be deathly dangerous. People do crazy things sometimes. So it's a bit risky. Number three, the Torah also has a big problem with people doing things that could be reckless. So a person gets some substance, he doesn't know where it's coming from, he doesn't know exactly what's happening, and he goes out of his mind. Now he's thinking that it's opening me up. But here's an interesting thing, just I want you to meditate on this. Ichimara said something very, very strong. The whole Torah is about being in reality, being deeply, deeply, firmly planted in reality in order to connect to God through his mitzvahs, right? God gave us mitzvahs to connect to the mitzvahs. Okay, think about this. There's certain types of people that are not obligated in mitzvahs. You guys know who that is? That's right. Somebody who's a cherish, somebody who is 
who's lost a lot of his senses, can't see, he's blind, deaf, mute, in a certain way he's connected to a bigger truth, but he's not connected to certain things down here. He doesn't have to say Shema or put on tefillin. He's not obligated in certain mitzvahs. A shoite, someone who is mentally disabled, uh, let's say someone severely autistic, they're not obligated from heaven to put on tefillin. They're not obligated. And a cotton, a, uh, a, a young child, is not obligated either. Why aren't they obligated? Because they don't have the capacity to connect to Hashem in those mitzvahs. Just like somebody who has lost, he's, he's mentally disabled or handicapped, he doesn't have the ability to connect to Hashem, some severely autistic, to know what tefillin is and what you have to think about when you put on tefillin. He might just be, you know, yelling all day. That, that's what, where he's at, at least on a simple level. At Baruch Hashem us, that we're not cher is shoyta cotton, we're obligated in mitzvahs. Because we have das, we have consciousness that we can intimately connect to God at every single second. So look what Ichimara said. The purpose of why we're here in this world is to intimately connect to Hashem. So now somebody's going to take some substance that exactly takes you out of the obligation of being able to connect to Hashem. He says, it's such a chutzpah. It's like going against the fabric of why we're put in this world. It's a bit of an intense thing. If somebody, in, so that's going forward, why we, we're very discouraging. If somebody in the past had some experience and it opened up his eyes, like, uh, like so many people, then there was a reason why that happened. And you have to thank Hashem that whatever happened, happened. But going forward, a person has to know, what am I doing now, from this point forwards? Am I relying on something? Or did I see something? I was given a glimpse, but now I want to earn it myself. Now I want to earn it myself. It's really the whole story of life, is that God will give you glimpses of things. Why does He give you a glimpse? For example, you have a child. So, when my kids are not quite walking yet, but they're about to, you know, like that, like, like they're standing, they're like, and they're like, like, oh my goodness, I'm standing. And we're all like, do it! And then, you know, nothing's happening, so I take their hand, and I start to walk with them. And they're like, I'm doing it! And then you take your hand away, and then, plop. So, how did the child feel? Maybe abandoned? What, what was that? I was going to say good. Well, good for the second day. Like, I'm doing it! And then all of a sudden... Empowered and then abandoned. Empowered and then abandoned. And they get up and they're like, You abandoned me. Did I? So on one level, yes. I abandoned them. But on the other level, I empowered them to give them the feeling that they could walk. Even though they're not walking themselves. It's fake. The whole thing is a, a psyop. They're not really walking. I'm helping them out. I'm giving them the sensation that they're walking. But it's really me and my guiding hand doing the same, doing that. Anybody ever learned how to ride a bike? You ever had, you know, like you're on the bike and then, you know, so I'm on the other side now, like I'm the tatty who's like pushing my kids on the bike, like, you know, okay, tatty, let go, let go. I was like, I'm, I let go, I let go. I, let go. I, let go. I never let go. I let go, I let go, like, I'm doing it, you're not letting go, you're not letting go, I'm letting go, I'm letting go. you're not letting go, no, 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 no. and then I actually let go, Pfft. ah, you abandoned me, you wanted me to let go. So why is it empowering and then abandoning? Because I want to empower them for that moment that they could feel like I can ride a bike. Because if you never feel like you could do it, so why do you want to get back up and do it? It has to be that you have this feeling, I can do this. But then you realize that, okay, it was a gift. It wasn't actually me doing it, but it was a feeling that I actually did something. But now I need to earn it myself. 
And now I need to do the hard work myself. I need to earn it myself. I need to go through that day-by-day process of earning it. This is the entire procedure, if people haven't realized, of going from Pesach to Shavuos. Passover night, Hashem completely pulls us out of Mitzrayim by our payas. We leave, we're on the 49th level of Tumo. We're in a very, very low state. It was a gift. And then we come out of Egypt and we have to start counting the Omer every single day. Now you do it yourself. So first we get this flash of inspiration like, I can do this. And then we come out and we have to build it up ourselves. Does anybody know how many days of the Omer do we count? 50 days, right? No, I thought it's 50 days. Tisperu chamishim yoyim. We only, what happened to the 50th day? But why don't we count it? It says count 50 days. Because on the 50th day after you counted 49 days, you realize that the entire thing was a gift to begin with. Even the fact that you were doing it yourself was also a gift. Okay, that's one of the secrets of life. Is that yes, Hashem gives you a light. He shows you something that you could do something big. Then He takes that light away from you. You feel abandoned, but you have this feeling deep within that I have something that I can, a recall, like I can go to that place, I can build this up again. And then at the end, you realize it was all a gift to begin with. The whole thing was a gift. Anybody know where else this happens? When you come into this world, when, you, when we're in our mother's womb, so the Gemara teaches us, the Gemara Nida, that we learn the entire Torah. It's a very holy place to be in the womb. While you're in the womb, you learn the entire Torah. It's amazing. It says, There's a light on top of our heads, conceptually, and you can see from one end of the world to the other, learning all the secrets of the Torah. And then you come out, and the angel gives you a little whack over here, and you forget the entire Torah. And you come into this world, and you don't, You don't remember. But you know it. So the question is, if you're not going to remember it, so why'd you learn in the first place? Because it's deep inside. You need to recover it. Because you come to this world, and anybody ever notice when you learn some Torah, it doesn't feel like someone's injecting something new into you, but rather it's a feeling like it's familiar, it's deep within, like I'm uncovering that which was always there. It just got hidden over. And the Shem does that. He puts it in you that it'll be familiar to you. When you start hearing Torah, it won't be foreign, because you'll already know I had this gift. It's familiar to me. Now, oh, I could do the work to reclaim this gift. In the womb, it was a gift. You're sitting there in the womb, in this, this jacuzzi, and it's just a uh, gewaldic. You're learning the entire Torah. It's get wonderful. From an angel. It's unbelievable. It's just a gift. It's like the father holding the child, pushing your son or daughter on the bike. You come into this world and you forget everything. You know, there's certain people that actually don't, that when they come into the world, they, they remember everything. There's certain wonder children called Yanukas, who are their little kids and they, they just know the whole Torah way. We have such people in the world. So one of the explanations is they never, the angel, they like dodged the angel and they never got whacked. So I don't know, you tell me, is that better or worse? Better in a way. So it's better because you know everything. From, from your youngest age, you know everything. And you're in this world and you just see everything with absolute clarity. No challenges. No but there's no challenges. You never earned it yourself. He never earned it. It's like a father that's always holding his son. He never fell one time. Well, it's better. So on one level, yeah, don't let the kid fall. But he never, he never learns how to ride a bike himself. So this is what I think about a lot of these substances. It's like getting this light that Hashem can give you. But now it's up to you to do the work. Now it's up to you to do the work. And the person that keeps taking it, it's like 
he's not realizing, okay, I saw something, but now can I do the real work that I can get that without this easy, like just, you know, press button here and all of a sudden, wow. Can I conjure, can I arouse those feelings from my own deep inner work? Or it's just a freebie. So that's the, that's the sugya. That's the sugya. Besides also, the Moshe Feinstein was very, very concerned about a number of other things. There's problems if a parent is not into it, it's going to be kibbut aim problems. There's also a problem of something called Ben Soira or Moira. The Ben Soira or Moira was a child who started to get involved in like seemingly not the worst things. He just really was into meat and wine. I mean a lot. He just guzzled meat and guzzled wine all day long. And then because he got too involved in kind of sensual things of this world, he had to find other means to support his habits, if you know what I'm saying. And he had to steal and he had to do not nice things in order to keep up his habits. And sadly, uh, sometimes people who get involved in these things, if they don't have that high, they go and do crazy things because they're jonesing for a high. And they'll steal and they'll do horrible things. So the Torah is concerned also with that element of somebody like getting needy with it. And then one thing leads to the next and he's, he's in, a, in a bad place. Everything good? Clear? We said we we're going to speak today about the light of the eyes. We have a few more minutes. So one of the things that we daven for, for our Torah, is that the hoyer einenu? We don't want just Torah Hashem. We want to have the Torah give light to our eyes. That there's a person who could have. Seemingly, he has some Torah, but there's no light in his eyes. Then there's somebody who has Torah, and there's a lot of light in his eyes. The hoyer einenu b'soyra secha. It says about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Torah soy mogen lanu, vihi meiris einenu. That the Torah of Rabbi Shimon, who is the author of the Zoyar, who brings all the mystical dimension of Torah, the Kabbalah to us, he's the world of light in the eyes. That a person could have one level of Torah, which you're learning the Torah, what do I have to do? That's the first level of Torah. Everybody has to know what you have to do. But then there's the level of Torah of what am I doing it for? What am I doing it for? Your wife asks you to take out the garbage. So, what do you do? You take it out, obviously. And by the way, give me a, a, a chat GBT translation of the following. Uh, Dennis, whenever you have a second, you mind taking out the garbage? Yeah. Okay, what is the translation of that? No, that was a... That was the that was the that was a simulation. So what does that actually mean? Means take it out right now. Means this thing stinks so badly. If this thing doesn't get out of here, I'm going nuts. Okay? It means it really should have been out a long time ago. This thing is stinky. So why do you take out the garbage? So you might say, you know, that's what she said. So that's obviously you have to do that. It's very, very important. But what if you realize that Taking out the garbage is a deep act of affection, of showing care and love, that having something stinky in the house like bothers my wife, and I love her, and I want to be close to her, and I don't want anything in the home that would, that would disrupt that love and that care, and give a feeling I, like I'm not sensitive to her needs. All of a sudden, it's a whole different garbage situation taking out matzav. So the same thing in the Torah. A person can keep the Torah, so, oh, you got to do the Torah. Why? Because Hashem said to do it. Or you could start learning the Torah that every single thing that I'm doing is this act of love, this deep secret in the relationship between us and Hashem. Your Torah becomes a totally different thing. The person who learns the Torah like that, his eyes become filled with light. Yes? How can I get there when I feel like I'm so hard, like I'm just so... Yeah, like how can you 
take it like from an obligation to a desire to please? So the question is, how do we take it from an obligation to a desire and get to that place? Judaism is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. If you could shift everything you've been taught, every Sunday school, every Tuesday school, every experience that you had growing up about obligations and commandments and you better or else and the big man in the sky is going to get you and dangling like a little spider over the, over the, 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 the heat, all that stuff and realize there's a loving relationship here and this is all acts of love, it changes everything. It takes time to shift that, but begin. Torah is a relationship. Hashem is in love with us. So use the analogy. If your wife says to you, uh, do you mind taking out the garbage? So how do you look at that? You understand that that could be an act of love? So use that, use that. Tefillin is an act of love. Oh, Hashem, I can have this amazing relationship with you through this? You're asking me something? That's beautiful. That's deep. That's amazing. And the more I learn about tefillin, that it's, an, it's, a, it's a gift that you gave to me, that you want to be close to me, you love me. So that's the type of Torah that gives you light in your eyes. When a person learns Torah like that, he just wants the Torah. Because he, he wants to do everything for his beloved, for Hashem. It says, The wisdom of a man gives light to his face. You have a lot of light. A lot of light on the face. Not just because it's, you know, shiny and it's got a lot of coconut oil on there. And you got all, you know, Hollywooded up and they like made it. There's people I met in, in Hollywood that were very dark. Their faces were dark. It's like, whoa. And they were like the, you know, big the big shots. It's very dark. Why is it? They're, they're, why, why, why are the face so dark? Trapped in the physical. Yeah. Physical. What's that? They lack Torah. Yeah, so, so and they lack this, the Torah we're talking about. The higher a name of the Torah secha. To have the Torah that's a Torah relationship. Once you switch everything into a relationship, nothing's the same. Nothing's the same. It's all a relationship. A loving relationship. The higher a neinu b'sayra secha, Hashem, please. I don't want to just have the basic of Torah. I want a Torah that illuminates my eyes. If you look here in the Shla Kodesh and many other... So really what we're talking about is understanding the secrets of Torah. The light of Torah is always referring to the secrets. It's always referring to what's called the hidden light, the oragonas, the great hidden light. That Hashem, I want the Torah, I want to unlock that there's, I know there's something deeper going on here. I know there's something very, very hidden. I know there was stuff that I was learning about in the womb that like, I want to get back. I want that stuff. I want that. I want that. Like when you have a beautiful, let's say a DMC with somebody you really love and you're, and you're, and you're staying up all night just looking into each other's eyes and talking to each other and it's moving and it's deep and you capture something together and even if you go back to life you know the next day she's in her college and you're in your place and you're you know doing your stuff and you're texting each other but you remember we had this moment that everything was amazing The Torah is, is telling you, you can have that place. You can have that place that's so amazing. You just have to see it in that way. So that's what you're asking for. Open up my eyes. Now you know what is also interesting about eyes? The word ayin. Anybody know what the word ayin means? It means an eye. But what's the word mayan? An ayin is a spring. So we think that eyes, right, are absorbing information. Right? The eyes are taking in. I'm taking in my setting right now. But the word for eye in Hebrew means a spring. It means your eyes are spraying out. It's like a springs are coming out of your eyes. So that's why when you see somebody, you could see that they smile through their eyes. 
you can see when someone's like very friendly in their eyes because your eyes are like projecting out. It's like, was that guy in X-Men? It's like, but not like red lasers that kill people. But it could be that. If a person has bad eyes, it's called eye in hara. You know what eye in hara is? It means he's got evil spraying out of his eyes. And that's why it says that if a person has an eye in hara and he looks at someone's field, it can make damage to his field because he's spraying out bad vibes onto the field. And people, oh, he's like jealous of the guy's field. He starts looking at your, at your Bentley and he's like spraying his evil onto it. And all of a sudden the Bentley gets into an accident because he's spraying evil out of his eyes. Yes? Um, just to connect to what we were talking about earlier with like the drug use, um, a lot of uh, drugs affect the eyes. Like, you know, like they like, like bloodshot, like dilated or whatever, like has a big effect on that. Uh, That's interesting that yeah, generally you're not seeing properly or the, or the eyes are getting affected. So according to what we're saying is that, yes, that there's a, there could be a, a tremendous obscuring of the eyes. And the Torah is very, very concerned. Don't take a person out of Torah and mitzvahs. So what's the real official approach? Earn it yourself. Stay away. Earn it yourself. If somebody is, a, like we said, God forbid, in a serious medical situation, or PTSD, or like real hardcore things, then that's a different discussion. But as far as a recreational usage, be very, very careful. Because you get up to heaven and they're going to say, okay, so now what did you earn in this world? What did you do? And he's going to say, oh, I just took a lot of LSD. Says, that, that was a gift. That wasn't yours. You never earned that. You never earned those experiences. But if a person has one, and then it brought him to yeshiva, because he sees like, whoa, everything is so much deeper than I thought. Way deeper than I thought. And then he earns it himself. He builds himself up day by day. He comes up to heaven and Hashem says, it's yours now. And I'll end with this, that Avram Avinu. Do you know Avram Avinu, what he did when he was young? He worshipped idols. That's hardcore, not allowed. And he's the first Jew. Abraham. So Abraham was worried when he came up to heaven that he was going to have this big black mark for all the idols that he worshipped. But after he worshipped the idols, and by the way, the idols are like psychedelics. They like open up crazy vistas for you. But they're easy and they're fast. So, Ab so Abraham said, Hashem, I'm worried that I'm not going to have merit because I started in this very, very lowly way. So Hashem said, no, those things brought you to me you're also going to get merit for that too. And that's what I wanted to add, that if you had the luck, luck, be experienced in your life of the outside world, outside the Torah, and you get your luck, your chance to dive into the Torah, in my case, you understand that you don't want to return to the normal world. The values, the, the principles are not nice. Torah is so we're saying that there's something so beautiful, there's something so, so beautiful. And when you do it yourself, it's yours forever. We should be Zayich HaMamish to earn, to earn everything ourselves. And to give Hashem a tremendous amount of nachas, Bezrat Hashem, we should be Zayich HaMashiach Tzidkenu, Mehra Vimeno, Omei. Call two of my friends. Chazak.